everybody. I'm super stoked to be back with a new book. We're going into Jonah. So for the last one I, that I did, I, I just finished recording Ruth, and I know that these might come out different, and I, I, you know, it's all up in the air as far as what I actually put out. I just try to complete stuff and then start putting it out. But I'm starting to record Jonah, and this I didn't do an intro for Ruth, but Jonah I felt like is just such an interesting book, and I wanted to do a quick intro on it. So most people are very familiar with the story of Jonah. Jonah disobeys God. He runs away. God swallows, has him swallowed by a big fish, spit out on the shore. He goes to Nineveh. They repent, and then Jonah's actually mad uh, at the redemption of these godless people. And so it's a really funny story because it's like the story of massive redemption by somebody that's clearly starts off as an enemy of God and Jonah you know has some practical things to work through but he's also like he knows that God is the God that forgives and so it's this really funny biblical account Ruth was a very serious biblical account but in the book of Ruth we see this um pattern of somebody going away from God, being completely emptied out, and then redeemed when they come back into God's sovereign, uh, when they get in line, in alignment with God's sovereign plan. And the, our, the instrument of redemption is somebody that is faithful. Here in Jonah, we see some opposite things happening. We see Jonah not being a faithful instrument of God, but God using him Anyway, in Ruth, we see this picture of um, a, a foreign woman who is not a part of Israel being the item of redemption. Here, it's a prophet of God who's not being faithful and does not want to be used to redeem Nineveh. And so there were a few things that I thought in Jonah that kind of helped tee us up as to what's happening in the story. So first off, Jonah has every right to be scared and terrified to go to Nineveh. We often think that he's just, uh, there's, he's just not wanting to do it. He's scared. He's, Nineveh was the capital city of Assyria. And Assyria, at this point in history, was the premier military power like they were just wiping out villages. They were very, uh, they're not great people. And in fact, Assyrians were especially cruel in battle. It's a well-known historical thing. Assyrians would like flay their enemies alive. They would do all kinds of crazy stuff. They were, they had a, um, a, a reputation to uphold in how they dealt with their enemies. And that's part of what they did. It was a deterrent for people attacking them as well. And so this is a very militaristic culture. Uh, you can think of the Spartans or all of these military cultures that they are very harsh and they often are not very pure, holy, you know, the way, the way that we see those things. So the Assyrians are the enemies of Israel and they're formidable. So Jonah has a real reason to be scared to go tell them that they're not living up to God's standards. What's interesting is how Jonah's bad attitude plays into this whole thing. Like Jonah is the prophet of God that I would argue is the most self-centered. And so this is a cautionary tale. It's almost like an anti-gospel tale. Because in, again, to contrast with Ruth that I just studied, it's, it's fascinating the similarities between Ruth and Jonah or how they're juxtaposed or contrasted against each other. Ruth is a story about a foreign woman, uh, and it's four chapters long, and it's about the uh, complete, you know, emptying out and restoration of the life of Naomi through this foreign woman. And here in Jonah, it's four chapters long. There is this turning away uh, from God by a prophet in Israel, uh, an Israeli uh, Hebrew prophet. He turns completely away. He's gone. He enters into death, a symbol of death, being swallowed by the fish for three days, and then is spit out to complete this. And the whole time he's self-centered. Whereas in Ruth, Ruth is completely selfless the whole time. So these contrasts are just very apparent now that I've read these two books side by side. And I would encourage you to do the same thing, actually. But Jonah is really funny. I don't think that 
we need to lose the funny, ironic, edgy tone with Jonah. And in fact, I think that's part of the charm of it. It is a caricature of a prophet. It really is this horrible story. I mean, it's pretty goofy how Jonah acts. It's pretty goofy and pretty wicked the motivations that Jonah has as they're revealed throughout the book. In fact, it even shows pagans acting more uh, acceptably than it does Jonah, right? So I think it, it points out that there is something to our actions, but our motivation also is important. In Christianity, there's a very much this idea that the physical body and spiritual need to be in alignment and be doing things for the right reason, which is not the same in every religion. I think it is unique to Christianity that uh, this, this how the spiritual and the bodily come together to be lived out. Faith without works is dead, all these types of, you know, bigger patterns there. So this is a really good story, Jonah. Uh, it, it's one that you don't have to forget everything that you knew about it as a child, which is really good. As a Bible story in Sunday school, often we hear the story of Jonah and you know, you wonder what's getting watered down here. Or Jonah is a pretty straightforward story. I think it's a very accessible. And so you don't have to completely forget everything you learned about Jonah in Sunday school. But I would say that, you know, you do need to be careful about the fact that you don't want this to become a moral issue. You don't want this to be a story uh, about Jonah uh, disobeying God and boil it down to this simple story of disobedience against God. There is so much more going on, and I think that that is just one of the things that is actually overblown, and it might not even be applicable. I think that part of the funniness and irony and edginess of the story is the fact that God is using Jonah, and Jonah is not into it at all. But God has chosen this vessel for use. He's going to have him participate in the sovereign plan. So for those of you, this might have been a little bit of a confusing intro if you're not familiar with the story of Jonah, but um, I, I hope that it made sense and added some value to, to some people, got you in the right mindset for Jonah. Um, you know, unlike stories like David and Goliath or Samson, where Samson's such a, a story that we learn in Sunday school, uh, it's such a popular story that we learn in Sunday school, but Samson gets watered down. Like the whole thing about his sexual immorality and turning away from God, all those things are horrendous, but we they get left down a lot in the children's story. Jonah is a really good story from your youth that you can really dig into and see the gospel message and how the Bible, if you read it woodenly, is, is going to you know, it's not going to make as much sense. It's not going to, you're not going to find that full power, but this being uh, a story where we can really dig into it, we can see the gospel pattern and how biblical authors were really inventive and creative in how they present the gospel message, which is apparent in Jonah. Um, so that's all I have for the, the intro to Jonah. I'm very excited to get into this book. It is a really fun book to study. I hope you're excited about it. Put down below what you think is going to be most interesting to study about Jonah. And uh, with that, I'll catch you in the next video. But we'll, uh, we'll jump into Jonah and study it. Like and subscribe to catch all the videos as they come out. Please, it really is awesome. And uh, with that, I'll catch you soon. All right, peace.